This concludes our discussion on the brainstem, and this means we are ready to move on to the next portion of the central nervous system. Based on the embryological divisions, the next section that we will cover corresponds to the prosencephalon, or forebrain here in blue. Throughout this video, it will happen that I'll refer to the forebrain or prosencephalon as simply the brain, so make sure not to get confused by that. Additionally, I want to mention briefly that in this discussion, we will not cover the cerebellum because I plan on doing a segment later that will be entirely dedicated to it when we will discuss motor systems. Now, to set the table for our discussion on the brain, I want to take a quick minute to rehash some concepts that we have gone through. First of all, from the structural and functional model of the central nervous system that I have established at the beginning of our conversation, you will remember that in a few words, the general role of the central nervous system, at least as I described it, is to interpret signals from the external and internal environments and generate commands to interact with the environment or to regulate our body. However, as you might suspect, this definition is extremely oversimplified as the entirety of the central nervous system integrates much more information in between to perform tasks that do not necessarily materialize in front of our eyes. For example, our capacity to store memories, feel complex emotions, our abilities to think, create, and process information without acting upon it are mostly all cognitive processes that happen at pretty much every moment of our lives. So, although it is true that a considerable portion of the central nervous system takes care of receiving sensory signals and sending motor outputs, and both of these components are critical to our cognitive processes, our central nervous system does much more. If we consider the individual functions of the spinal cord and the brainstem, you will remember that the two had a few similarities in the fact that they both conducted sensory and motor tracts through their structures and that they both were the origin or receptors to bundles of neurons called nerves. Nonetheless, it remained that the brainstem was much more complex than the spinal cord because of all the diversity of nuclei it had and thus the diversity of function it mediates. Also, the brainstem was much more complex because, in addition to relaying signals from the brain, it also sent its own projections to modulate cognitive aspects of the brain and the body. Now, it will be no surprise for you to hear that, with respect to the brainstem and especially the spinal cord, the jump in complexity for the brain is pretty substantial. As a result, this level of complexity makes it that there are hundreds of different angles that we could take to discuss the properties of the brain ranging from the different networks that mediate our consciousness to the individual neurons that make all of this possible. Now, because I plan on covering sensory, motor, and more abstract systems of the brain in their respective videos, I want this video to focus on more general topics to give us a good foundation along with the sections on the spinal cord and brainstem, such that when we're covering, let's say, the auditory or visual systems, there will be a good continuity with what we've covered here. Now, throughout this section, you will see different cross-sections and perspectives of the surface of the brain, and the basis for all of these drawings comes from a software that models what is called the MNI brain. In essence, the software allows you to navigate around with a 3D brain and interact with it from many different perspectives. As a side note, the abbreviation MNI stands for the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is the place that came up with this model and they did so by taking the average brain structure from different people. If you want to download this software, I have included a link in the description that offers a version for Linux, macOS, and Windows. Alright, so to get started on the anatomy, I first want to review the neuroanatomical navigation terminology that we have established in the very first sections of our discussion because a lot of the upcoming terminology that you will see is based on these terms. If we consider this view of the brain, Given that the brain is a three-dimensional structure, we can analyze it by decomposing it into two-dimensional planes that each take different cross-sections of the brain into consideration. In no particular order, the first plane is the horizontal plane and it divides the brain into a top and bottom half. The second plane is the coronal plane, which divides the brain in a front and back half. And finally, the last plane is the sagittal plane, which divides the brain into a left and right half. Now, all these planes produce their respective cross-sections, but to navigate within them, there is additional terminology that is used. In the forward and backwards axis, the direction that goes towards your face is the anterior direction, and the direction that goes towards the back of your head is the posterior direction. In the upper-down axis, the direction towards the top of the head is called either dorsal or superior, 
And with respect to the brain, these two words are pretty much interchangeable, but some anatomical structure use the dorsal, while others use the superior, so I will include them both. Likewise for the bottom direction, the words associated are ventral and inferior. When it comes to the axis that goes towards the sides of your head, the middle point is often referred to as the midline, and as you go away from it, you go towards the lateral directions. This little review should suffice for us while we cover some structures of the brain. One last detail that I want to quickly mention is that in the upcoming sections of this discussion, and even in previous diagrams, I have mostly used two views of the brain, the view of the lateral surface and the view of the medial surface, which can be obtained by taking a sagittal cut right in the middle of the brain to separate the two hemispheres. This cut is also known as the mid-sagittal cut. Throughout this video, we will obviously cover more perspectives and surfaces of the brain, but I wanted to particularly point these two out because they are the most common views in any textbooks covering neuroanatomy. Now, as I said just previously, we can generally divide the brain based on its anatomical landmarks or functional regions. Our ability to divide the brain based on its anatomy comes from the fact that it has an extensively folded surface that produces distinguishable ridges and grooves that create apparent frontiers between regions. Presumably, the reason for this highly folded surface is to be able to fit our very large surface area of gray matter into our skulls for us to be able to process complex cognitive behaviors. To see these ridges and grooves more clearly, we can take a coronal cross-section. As you can see, the surface of the cortex is filled with folds. If we zoom on one of these folds, the first thing that is most apparent is that there is a beige layer and a white layer. The beige layer corresponds to gray matter, and the white layer corresponds to white matter. If you recall our discussion on the brainstem and spinal cord, you will remember that the gray matter corresponded to the cell bodies of the neurons, and the white matter corresponded to the axons of the neurons that are covered in myelin. Now, one particularity that I will mention right now about the brain is that the gray matter that covers the surface of the brain is also referred to as the cortex. Hence, anytime you hear about the cortex or anything being preceded by cortical, it corresponds to the external layer of gray matter. If we go back to the folds of the brain, an important point of terminology is the fact that the grooves, which are the bottom part of the fold, are called sulci or sulcus in singular, and the ridges are called gyri or gyrus in singular. Although the distribution and location of each sulcus varies in each individual, there are some sulci and gyri that we all share for the most part, and thus constitute good anatomical landmarks to navigate around the brain. More importantly, beyond being specific anatomical landmarks, I want to place a special emphasis on the knowledge of the different sulci, because as you can see in the cross-section, most of the gray matter is hidden from the external surface, and given that the gray matter, as we will cover later, is the region where most of the neuronal integration happens, the sulci are very important to consider from a functional perspective. If we first consider the lateral and medial view of the brain, there are four principal frontiers that are very characteristic of the human brain formation. The four are the central sulcus, the lateral or sylvian fissure, the parietal occipital sulcus, and the preoccipital notch. As a side note, a sulcus and a fissure pretty much represent the same thing, but a fissure is much deeper than a sulcus. Altogether, these four frontiers divide the cortex into four general lobes. The central sulcus divides the frontal and parietal lobes, and the lateral fissure divides the temporal from the frontal and parietal lobes. The parietal occipital sulcus and the preoccipital notch separate somewhat arbitrarily the occipital lobe from the parietal and temporal lobes. The four lobes represent the broadest way of dividing the brain in terms of anatomy, but as you can see, Within each lobe, there are many more sulci and gyri that we can use to our advantage to divide the brain further. Let's start with the lateral view. As a preemptive note, this diagram will get filled pretty quickly with anatomical landmarks, so if it's your first time seeing them, make sure to go slowly through them so that you don't get overwhelmed. One tip of advice I can give you to ease the load of learning these regions is to make sure you are comfortable with the neuroanatomical navigational terms because, as you will see, pretty much all of the gyri and sulci have very logical names that are based on their positions. Starting at the central sulcus, if we go in the anterior direction towards the frontal lobe, we will meet two distinctive sulci, the superior and inferior precentral sulci. Together with the central sulcus, these two sulci form the boundaries to the precentral gyrus.
The remaining portion of the frontal lobe can be divided into three general gyri, the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus. The two sulci that divide these regions are the superior and inferior frontal sulci. Within the inferior frontal gyrus, there are some additional important areas that I would like to point out because they mediate important roles in speech production. These areas are called pars opercularis, pars triangularis, and pars orbitalis. The anterior ascending ramus separates the pars opercularis from pars triangularis, and the horizontal ramus separates the pars triangularis from pars orbitalis. Altogether, these regions generally represent the main areas of the frontal lobe. If we go back to the central sulcus, but now we go in the posterior direction to the parietal lobe, we will come across the post-central sulcus, which forms the boundaries with the central sulcus to the post-central gyrus. In a sort of perpendicular orientation to the post-central sulcus, we can observe the intraparietal sulcus, which divides the remaining parietal lobe into the superior and inferior parietal lobules. Again, due to its functional role, the inferior parietal lobule can be further divided into two important regions. The first more anterior region is the supramarginal gyrus, and the more posterior region is the angular gyrus. Now, if we consider the temporal lobe, its divisions on the lateral surface are much simpler. A bit like the frontal lobe, it is divided into three gyri, the superior, medial, and inferior temporal gyri, and between them, we can find the superior and inferior temporal sulci. By the way, I want to mention that one good trick to find the supramarginal and angular gyri is that to find the supramarginal gyrus, you can follow the course of the lateral fissure, and to find the angular gyrus, you can follow the course of the superior temporal sulcus. When it comes to the occipital lobe, we will leave it as it is. There are some sulci on its lateral surface, but they are not the most important ones. This final detail completes our picture for the lateral surface. As I said, I am well aware that there is a lot of terminology and the diagram is loaded with information, but if you go slowly with the neuroanatomy axis in mind, learning these regions should be much easier. Now, when it comes to the medial surface, there is also some important gyri and sulci to consider. One of the most prominent sulci is called the cingulate sulcus and forms the main boundaries for the cingulate gyrus. Along with another sulcus called the paracentral sulcus, the cingulate sulcus also formed the boundaries for the paracentral lobule, which is a shared region between the frontal and parietal lobes. In the parietal lobe, the cingulate sulcus and the parieto occipital sulcus form the boundaries for the precuneus gyrus. Just like the precentral sulcus that was anterior or in front of the central sulcus, the precuneus gyrus is anterior to the cuneus gyrus, which is located in the occipital lobe. In addition to the cuneus gyrus, the occipital lobe also contains the lingual gyrus, which is separated from the cuneus gyrus by the calcarine sulcus. In essence, these areas are the main gyri and sulci of the cortex that are outlined on the medial surface. There are no obvious and prominent sulci in the temporal lobe that we can clearly see from this view. To complete our picture on the relevant sulci and gyri of the brain, I want to consider the ventral and dorsal surfaces of the brain. As a reminder, the dorsal surface is a view from the top and the ventral surface is a view from the bottom. Again, to get it situated, we can find the frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes across both of these views. Additionally, we can see the central sulcus on the dorsal surface. One aspect that I have kind of taken for granted for the moment, but that we can better appreciate from these two views, is the fact that the brain is composed out of two cerebral hemispheres, a left and a right one. The separation between the two hemispheres is called the longitudinal fissure, and again, remember that a fissure is just a deeper sulci. Now, for the ventral surface, there are a few sulci and gyri in the temporal lobe that I would like to point out. First, recall the three gyri that we have covered in the lateral surface, the superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyri. These gyri are separated by the superior and inferior temporal sulci. Now, medially to these regions, we can find two other important gyri, the parahippocampal gyrus and the fusiform gyrus. The parahippocampal gyrus is separated from the other gyri by the rhinal and collateral sulci, and the fusiform gyrus is separated from the inferior temporal gyrus by the lateral occipital temporal sulcus. To better see these structures, we can consider a ventral view with no cerebellum and no brainstem.
As you can see, the boundary between the temporal and occipital lobe is a bit vague on the ventral surface, and rightfully so, because there are no evident landmarks to divide them, so in this diagram you can take this temporal occipital division with a grain of salt. Up until now, we have talked a lot about the landmarks of the brain, but not so much about what actually happens within or around them. It turns out that to process the world around us and ourselves, the brain is divided into distinct functional regions that sometimes process very specialized bits of information, or sometimes integrate information from different areas to create complex cognitive functions. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.